Oh, yeah, it says record there. Just, just make sure that stays okay. on. Yeah. Okay. Good. So my name is Spence Patrick. I met most of you, but um, I'm doing mine on robo advisors. Uh, little introduction. Um, I'm going to kind of introduce sort of the ethical. You know, kind of take this concept and put it into ethical uh, in a way that you could analyze it ethically. Um, it's not the most, uh, I guess, what do you, what's the word, uh, contentious of, you know, like a lot of people aren't heated up over it, but there are ethical questions out there. And I think as they grow in popularity, they're still pretty young. Uh, these ethical questions might come more into scope. Um, you know, I'll explain what robo-advisors are and the impact of them. Uh, and then go through the ethical theories, um, the usual, and then uh, conclude and open it up. So, ethical questions. Uh, basically, a, a robo advisor is, is beginning. They're, they're these automated uh, machines that are beginning to replace human advisors. Um, and so, the questions I'm going to ask, which will make a little more sense once I kind of explain what they are, is basically a, a financial advisor has these fiduciary duties that they need to fulfill. Um, and that is basically to act solely in the best interest of their customer or client. You know, everything they do is with the best intent of their customer and client. They're not trying to take advantage of them. Um, and then one of the ethical questions is whether robo advisors actually fulfill these fiduciary duties. Um, and then another uh, sort of ethical question, it's kind of big picture, is uh, are these robo advisors maybe setting up uh, younger novice investors for failure? And I'll kind of show you why why I question that. Um, and then my argument that I make is that in their current state, uh, robo advisors can't fulfill the role as a fiduciary, as they lack the due diligence that's necessary for a financial advisor, and um, also the guidance. And I'll I'll go more into detail on that. <clears throat> so what are robo advisors? Which might have been better to lead with, but uh, basically right now they're a tool aimed to ass assist investors. Uh, people like you and me that maybe have money that we want to invest, they're an automated tool. Um, currently, they're being used with human advisors or using them as, as tools to help them out, but, but they're also out there where you know I could go log in, build an account, do everything, never talk to a human, and be invested in the market. Um, they, they are set up because of their, their automation. They're aimed to save money for their clients, their investors. Um, they use these different practices, which I'll, I'll kind of explain to give you an idea. Um, basically, because they're a computer, they can do you know same techniques that financial advisors have used to help their clients save money. Uh, they can do it automatically, 24/7. Um, and tax loss harvesting is one where basically, uh, come the end of the year, you have stocks that have done poorly. Uh, it'll automatically sell those stocks and replace them with a similar security so that your your you know portfolio that matches your risk is the same. And uh, they can do this automatically. It'll sell off securities that have done poorly so you can realize you know a tax loss. It'll offset you know any tax gains. So you have a less tax you have to pay. Um, I put an asterisk by they use passively managed portfolios. So passively managed portfolios would be like index funds where you just buy into them, you're not trying to beat the market, you're, you're buying in, you're not, um, you're not selling strategically or buying strategically, you're just kind of buying into them. Um, so you're, as a financial advisor, they can use passively managed portfolios as well, like a human advisor can use these as well. Um, robo-advisors typically are using these, um, but there are robo-advisors out there that have algorithms set in them for active investing, meaning they're trying to pick stocks to beat the market, to do better than the market. Um, and I'll kind of touch base on those too, but I'm, I'm really questioning robo-advisors as a whole. So um, what they do is, you know, as you log in, you kind of build a portfolio, a profile for yourself. Um, they gather personal data to assess the risk level. Some of the things, you know, that would go into a risk assessment is, you know, are you married, do you have kids, uh, how much debt do you have? Um, how much you know? How much money do you have? You know, all your financial and also just your life circumstances, so that they can figure out. You know, are you somebody who can take on a lot more risk? And you know, you have a good good job, whatever. Can you take on more risk? Um, to, you know, an ex expectation for a higher return. Um, and then they'll basically they'll take all this 
risk information and they kind of pull it up and then they, they send out these um, either passively managed options or maybe actively managed if that's what you choose. It'll also ask you know, what, what you want to do. Um, and then it'll set up a, a portfolio and it'll tell you like, you know, pretty simplified options of what you can buy or not buy um, to place your money. So you don't have to talk to a human at all. You can go on, it tells you your risk, and then it gives you some really simple options on you know, how do you want to invest in the market. Um, and so once it's set up your portfolio, maybe it's, um, you know, if you're younger, maybe it's 80% stock, uh, point, or 10% bonds, and 10% that's kind of the real estate. Um, it'll continuously rebalance this portfolio as you go. So, you know, in a year, maybe your stocks have grown. Um, so they actually make up about 84% of your, of your portfolio now compared to bonds. So it'll sell off your stock and set it back to match your risk. Uh, you know, what, what you've told it you want as, as your basic portfolio, what, you've, what it's assessed that you want after you've given it the options. Um, are there any questions on that before I continue? All right. Um, so the target market is primarily focused on younger people, uh, really our generation, people who are a little bit more comfortable with technology, um, and then it's also people who have lower assets to invest. A lot of human advisors, you know, because they're going to be spending the time to work with you, they kind of expect a um, a minimum asset fee. You know, maybe they want hundred, you have hundred thousand dollars to invest because they charge based on a um, a wrap fee or. Some of them charge on wrap fees, some are commissioned. And so, you know, if you have $100,000 and they charge 1%, um, they're gonna make more money for their time. Uh, and robo-advisors charge a lot less. Um, human advisors usually one to 2%, a robo-advisor, um, a lot more like 0.15 to 0.25% because they're robots so they can handle uh, that clientele and they don't, they don't have the same constraints that a human does. Um, so, Younger people who don't have hundred thousand dollars to invest, uh, this is a good option for them. It's kind of an untapped market, um, and then it aims at a lot of customers who are maybe a little less interested in doing their own portfolio manage, picking their own stocks, picking what they want to do. So they like it to just be condensed and simplified, so they can go about their day and go be a computer programmer or be a um, you know what, whatever whatever they do. Um, I think it covered all that. So I'm gonna kind of go into the impact of robo-advisors um, and sort of where I see some issues. So with the robo-advisors, uh, you know, they're still kind of small and new now, um, but <clears throat> as they grow, they're kind of taking people away from the human interaction that they used to have and putting them more with the user interface on their, their phone or their computer. Um, so, one, uh, well, I'll just go into the issues on that. <laughs> Some of the issues I see with this, um, you know, a major, you know, the lack of continuous risk assessment. So as I mentioned before, uh, there's a lot of information that goes into assessing your risk, um, but that stuff changes over time. So, you know, I. Maybe I started investing uh, when I was single, and I set up my profile when I was single with no kids, and you know, had a, a really good job. Well, later on, I'm married. I have kids that depend on me. Um, maybe there was a death in the family, and some inheritance came in. Maybe I lost my job. Things that change that I, you know, because I'm doing my own thing uh, in life, I may not remember to go tell the computer that this has changed. Um, whereas with a human advisor, with that established relationship, uh, I think you more often would talk with a human um, and in passing information, they may be able to learn things that a robot really has no cue to learn. You know, the robot, you know, I guess the best it could do is say like, hey, has something, you know, happened in your life? Um, but as of now, there's really no way of the robot knowing to come to you and say, hey, you need to update your profile. Um, whereas with, with a human interaction that would come from having a relationship with a financial, a human financial advisor, they would be able to pick up on a lot of that. So. There's really a lack of uh, due diligence in their their risk assessment, you know, as it continues on. Um, and then there's another phenomenon that occurs. Um, I just kind of have this. This is just the uh, generic S and P 500 uh, stock market um, that I pull. But so you know, the 
the idea that probably everyone's heard is with the stock market, you want to buy low and sell high. That's how you make money. So you want to buy where you know the price is low, and then once it gets high, sell. Um, and in hindsight, it looks easy, but uh, when you're emotionally involved with your money, there's actually a phenomenon that occurs that, that doesn't always happen. What happens is people start buying in, um, and then when you have like a long crash, that's several years, like 2000 or, or 2008, um, day after day, you wake up and you see your, your portfolio getting smaller and smaller and dwindling. And um, a lot of people, because they just want to, you know, they get to here maybe, or here, and they they're scared they're gonna lose everything that they own. They have this emotional attachment to this money because they worked hard for it. And they tend to, to want to sell out and preserve it all as cash. And maybe they'll jump back in when the market's good. So they end up actually selling pretty low. And then once the market starts to come up, after a while they rebuild that confidence. And so they feel safe again, so they start buying in. So, you know, once they sell down here, they've realized this entire loss. If this was somebody's portfolio, you know, that's when, it, when they actually have now lost money and then when they buy in here, they're, they're actually um, you know, buying in at a higher price. Um, and then 2008, you know, was quoted that a lot of you know, this big drop was also public panic. You know, there's, there's the housing market and there's a lot of issues that happen, all sorts of things that caused the market to crash. But people, um, you know, a lot of young investors emotionally attached to their money just want to sell out and save it. And they end up selling when really the best time would be to buy. And they end up buying back in really the best time would be to well, sell or, or keep, whatever. Um, so this is like a common mistake that happens. And you know, part of what a financial human advisor can do is when the market's crashing, you know, part of the stress in their job is talking to you on the phone and talking to you for making these bad decisions. You know, you want to sell out and they, they can remind you, hey, the stock market's volatile, you know, ideally this might be the time to buy. You know, it'd be like Right. So they, they can they can explain to you, you know, help you sit through it and be okay. Um, the robo-advisor, it's a lot more difficult to do that because you don't have that human interaction and you know, who's to say that everybody is, is going to do the proper, uh, I guess, uh, edu educate, well, gather the proper, proper education they need in order to handle their own investments. Um, so, I'll, I kind of, I'm gonna do a little sub-conclusion here is that you know, without that human interaction, a lot of people, because these user interfaces simplify everything and make it really simple, they're encouraged um, to go out and invest on their own. And um, you know, and it's it's kind of encouraged in a way where it's like, hey, you know, we're doing all the same stuff, and this is a safe way to invest on your own. Uh, go ahead and do it. And, and by itself, that's not a bad thing. But it's times where the market crashes for a substantial amount of time that that could be setting up, you know, all these people that are buying into the robo advisors, setting them up for, for failure. Um, and, you know, one thing uh, that makes this uh, argument more valid is it hasn't really been tested. So this is just from uh, 2011, I think, or maybe somewhere in between 2012. And, um, you know, if you look at, this is, this is back to all the way to 1980, you know, and you can see that these stock market crashes were several years long. So when you look at, at you know, how the stock has been since uh, really the robo-advisors began coming into the picture, um, there really hasn't been any substantial amount of time where there's been a drop. You know, maybe there's been a couple of weeks or a month where it's dropped a little bit. You know, these were the, the in August and October, there were a couple of crashes. And so there hasn't been like a, a tested time where these robo-advisors have been in action and there's been a huge market drop that's lasted several years and people really start to panic. Um, they were, I will say that during these times, they did attempt to kind of see how their users reacted. So they do have ways where they can count the number of logins that a user does. You know, once the market starts to crash, they can see which customers are a little bit more nervous because they're logging in more, logging out. Um, and you know they, they may be able to send an alert like, hey, just remember, you know, the market's volatile. Selling out would be, you know, a very expensive mistake that you could make right now. Um, and and what they found when they were kind of tracking this is that there wasn't a lot of panic in uh, the investors' eyes. But you know what I kind of counter to that is that that's a pretty short amount of time comparatively to see your portfolio, you know, start to to drop. Um, and this is just kind of comparing the two, like I already did. But you know. Basically, the drops we've had have been, you know, a couple of weeks. Whereas, you know, 2000, 2008, they were 
you know, pretty pretty long time to be watching, you know, your hard-earned money start to, to go down. So I'm going to uh, go through the ethical theories now, um, and and basically my, my argument is, you know, whether or not these uh, these robo advisors are you know can fulfill their fidu fiduciary duties, and then also, you know, the the people that are putting out these programs, you know, they they are aware, they have seen the, the past that people have panicked and they sell out, and that's a mistake that novice investors make often. Um, so are they kind of setting up, you know, knowing how investors react, are they kind of setting them up for failure in the long run, which, you know, obviously wouldn't be fulfilling the fiduciary duty. Um, so going with Kantianism, obviously uh, using the fiduciary duty uh, title, it's uh, investors, advisors' duty to act in the best interest of their investors. Now, with like the wrap fee structure that I mentioned, where like a human advisor has 1% of the assets under management, so um, every year they get 1% of how big that investor's portfolio is, and with the robo-advisor, it's 0.25. So ultimately, the investment advisor and the robo-advisor need them to succeed. So with the wrap fee, it makes sense that the advisor is working in the best interest of the client. However, I'm saying that you know, knowing how young advisors, young investors act, um, you know, I, I don't think that they are acting in the best interest by supplying them with these automated machines. <clears throat> um, you know, and like I mentioned, a lot of the value in that, you know, difference of 0.25% to 1%, a lot of that value is just um, building kind of a bridge between you and your money so that emotional decisions aren't made. <clears throat> so, um, using act utilitarianism, you know, to weigh basically whether this is ethically a good thing or a bad thing, it um, kind of shows maybe some of the shortcomings of act utilitarianism. Um, so if you're analyzing it as like, you know, is this good for uh, all parties involved? So investors and advisors, I guess you could say the market as a whole. Um, and it's, it's hard to analyze because if you, if you look at, you know, if you, if you use this example that I gave, if you were to invest $10,000 in a portfolio that, you know, expected to return 10% in 10 years, you know, looking at that there, it would show that there's actually, you know, the money you'd save from paying fees to the advisor uh, would be about $1,700 that's in favor of the robo-advisors because they're paying less fees. Um, but, you know, it doesn't take in the probability of the market crashing, the uncertainty of that. So once you start looking at that, you know, if there's a, a higher percentage that uh, using a robo-advisor is going to cause the investor to sell out at poor times, then, you know, it's obviously a bad decision, you know, and ethically it's it's not a good product to be putting in the hands of um, younger investors. Um, you know, and like I mentioned, you know, if the market crashes uh, and you sell out, that's really when you lose the money. If the market crashes and you stay in and it comes back to its expected price, you don't, you didn't lose anything. Um, so with act utilitarianism, it's kind of hard to tell because you can't predict the future. So you can't really, it's harder to evaluate. Um, and then rule, rule utilitarianism. Um, you know, obviously this is a growing growing market, and you know, assuming they don't find any huge issues with robo advisors, like a big market crash, um, they're projected to have uh, 2.2 trillion by 2020. So they're going to take up a lot bigger um, space in the investment world. Right now, it's it's really small. Um, and you know, maybe they'll start growing in different markets. People who have bigger assets to invest, they like the robo advisors. Um, and so once you have a bigger um, portion of the market that is made up of maybe people that maybe would fall into the category of having a higher chance of, of making those mistakes that could cost them a lot of money. Well, for an economy as a whole, that's actually a bad thing because the, the market starts crashing, it's gonna crash even harder just from public panic, from people making these, these mistakes. Um, so really utilitarian, if I say if everyone adopted robo-advisors and using robo-advisors, they become more of a, which they are, they're growing pretty rapidly. Um, you know, it could have pretty serious impacts, uh, which again, have to do with uncertainty. So it's a little bit harder to evaluate. Um, social contract theory, so in order to tie this in, I kind of used the SEC and FINRA, the Security Exchange Commission, the financial industry for uh, investment services, yeah. Um, so these are the two authorities that help kind of regulate 
Um, they've mostly been created or have been have gained a lot of power when market crashes happen. A lot of people get, you know, hurt in these market crashes. Uh, these commissions came up and they kind of set the rules. So it sort of has to do with social contract um, in the sense that investors, brokers, advisors all uh, adhere to these rules to make the market a better place. Um, and they are really having to revamp all the rules that they have on whether robo-advisors can fulfill the fiduciary duties uh, that are required of a financial advisors. So they have to rewrite a lot of the rules and they've issued a lot of warnings uh, talking about these uh, robo-advisors. But as far as like a, a human, uh, you're, you know, a personal investor, would they be willing to give up robo-advisors for, um, you know, for the good of the community as a whole? Um, you know, it's at this point definitely not. You know, they, there's a big niche for the, the robo-advisors and they're gaining popularity. Um, and I think it's a little bit harder to actually show the potential damage until it's too late, as most things with the financial market is. It's usually too late before everyone realizes whatever thing they've been using is not so great. Virtue ethics theory. Um, the SEC commissioner, Kara Stein, you know, pointed out in, in a warning, you know, the investors need to realize that when the market crashes, there isn't gonna be a financial, uh, you know, a human on the phone talking them down from their mistakes. Um, and then Warren Buffett, um, I don't wanna take this out of context too much, but he said, beware of geeks bearing formulas. This was after the 2008 crash. Um, and this maybe had more to do with like active trading robo advisors, but uh, he, uh, you know, there was a, a guy who came up with an algorithm uh, before 2008 that kind of helped uh, control or made people feel more comfortable with the uncertainty that's in real estate markets. And so when they evaluate portfolios, they kind of just blindly accepted his algorithm that he created, um, you know, and they loved it. And then that really was a big part of the huge crash that they saw. And so that was kind of in response to that. Um, this was a letter to his, his shareholders. Um, you know, I looked up some other, like uh, Dave Ramsey is a famous uh, investment counselor, I guess, or a financial counselor. Um, and he, he kind of warns the same things. Um, you know, they both would probably agree that for an investor doing the index fund, things that these robo-advisors are investing in isn't a bad thing, but having the lack of a human counselor would is, uh, you know, a, a bit uh, dangerous. Um, this just kind of lists the other ones. Subjective relativism, you know, basically people have the choice to do whatever, you know, what's best for them. Um, in this instance, you know, it's basically these investors have shown they don't really know what's best for them because, uh, you know, they're investing when times are good, whatever market crashes, that's when it's too late. And they don't really know what's, what's ahead of them. Um, and then the other ones, I, I didn't really see any way that they, they fit. <clears throat> um, so, you know, to conclude, robo-advisors are basically an automated tool that's gaining power and their responsibilities are becoming, you know, a little bit greater as a rule of a financial advisor. Um, and that, with this technology, humans are drifting away from uh, from other humans. You know, they like the user interface that they can they can do with the comfort of their bed. Um, you know, and this could have serious financial consequences in the next large recession. And so, ethically, handing out you know building this technology is, is setting up uh, humans for failure. And uh, yeah, any questions on that? Still recording? Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Are you? St they're still making their decision, right? It's not an automated buy sell by the Robocop or Robo. Robocop. Uh, Robocop. Yeah, the Robo advisor or whatever. So they're they're still having to click the button to sell, right? Yeah. So like a like a, if you it basically if you were using like an online investment tool. Similar. Okay. Very similar. It's just it simplifies. The At first, I thought it was. They were selling and buying at certain points. No, there are active managed and that's robo what, advisors, okay. and they might more be in the role of okay. actually buying and selling strategically. Um, but yeah, for the most part, these passive funds, uh, you, you have to go in and sell yourself. And so, but my argument, you know, just to add, just to uh, set it in, is that you know maybe you do, but maybe somebody else doesn't have the wisdom that's mm -hmm. necessary and that you get with a human advisor. And so they go on and they like to invest with themselves. 
they do it and then they go and click the button yeah. at the wrong time because they Makes don't sense. have the proper filters, I guess. Any other questions? Okay, thanks.